Amen. So keep a place in Philemon and turn to Colossians chapter 4. So we're studying through Colossians chapter 4, and we just read Philemon. I want to show you the connection there this evening and show you um, what um, we're getting at. But look down at Colossians chapter 4 as you keep a place in Philemon. Look at Colossians chapter 4 and verse number 9. So we're looking at some of the people that Paul is mentioning towards the end of his letter to the Colossians. And in Colossians chapter 4, in verse number 9, he mentions um, someone else besides Tychicus, who we talked about last week. And in Colossians chapter 4, look at verse number 9, where the Bible says, With Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you, they shall make known unto you all things which are done here. So, of course, um, Tychicus was to go and be a, um, a messenger to Paul and tell him how the church at Colossae was doing. Um, also, Onesimus is part of that um, that crew. So who is Onesimus? Turn um, back to Philemon to, to get to who Onesimus is and the connection between Colossians and um, Philemon. And we need to know like who Philemon is, first of all. So Philemon is this guy that Paul is writing a letter to that has a church in his home. And I believe if you have a place still in Colossians chapter 4 and you look at verse Number nine, I believe Philemon, this is just my opinion, the Bible's not super clear on this, but it's my opinion that Philemon actually runs the church of Colossae. So we can tell that, or that my evidence for that is in verse number nine, where it says, with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother, who is one of you? So Onesimus here is identified as one of the people of this church. And then in Philemon, we see that, you know, Onesimus used to be with Philemon at this, this house, or at least he worked for Philemon. I don't know how involved he was in the church. We'll get, that, get to that detail in a few minutes. But who is Philemon? He's this man who held a church in his home, and possibly the church in Colossae. I think it is, but the Bible doesn't specifically say. Look at Philemon chapter 1 and verse number 10. So the purpose of the book of Philemon is Paul, he's writing to this church leader um, of this church in this house, and he's beseeching, he's, he's, you know, he's, he's addressing this guy named Onesimus. Look at verse number 10 of Philemon, and there's only one chapter, Philemon, in verse number 10. I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, who I have begotten in my bonds. So Paul is in prison when he's writing the book of Philemon, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but, to, but now profitable to thee and to me. Now... Many, I've, I've heard many sermons on Philemon. I've heard many sermons about Onesimus. I think people are generally too hard on Onesimus because the Bible doesn't really say that he did anything like wrong. It just says that he was at one point unpro unprofitable to Philemon and then now he's profitable to Paul. Okay, but if you look at verse number 10, there's something very important that happened to Philemon, or not to Philemon, to Onesimus. So Paul, he's, he's kind of interceding for Onesimus to this church leader and he's, because he wants to send Onesimus back to Philemon. So he's, he's writing this specific letter to Philemon to intercede for Onesimus. But he says in verse number 10, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds. What Paul is saying there is that he got Onesimus saved, is what he is saying. He's begotten him. And then he says, which in time past was to thee, to you, unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me. So he's saying, look, this guy, he's like, this guy, he, he was not profitable before, but I got him saved. Now he's profitable to me, and he will be profitable to you, is what he is saying about Onesimus. So there's an important point here, is that not only did he get saved, but he became profitable after he got saved. Look at verse number 12 of Philemon. Verse number 12. Whom I have sent again, thou, for, therefore, thou therefore receive him, that is, my own bowels, whom I would have retained with me, that in thy stead he may have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. Remember, he's profitable. So he's valuable to Paul. Paul says he's profitable to thee and to me. He says, but in verse 14, well, if he's profitable to you, Paul, why would you want to send him to the church at Colossae or to Philemon's church. And he says in verse 14, but without thy mind would I do nothing. Without your mind. He's like, he's saying, without you in mind, I wouldn't do anything. That thy benefit 
should not be as it were of necessity, but willingly. He's saying, Paul is saying, he's like, this guy's profitable to me, but I'm going to send him to you because I'm thinking of you. He's like, I'm thinking of how valuable he will be to you. Look at verse 15. For perhaps he therefore departed for a season. Now, like I didn't say that like he did anything wrong. I'm not saying he didn't do anything wrong, okay? That thou shouldest receive him forever. Paul is saying, look, there's a reason that he left. There's a reason that he left. He came to me and now he'll go back profitable. Paul is saying, look, this could have been a divine thing that thou should receive him forever. Not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved, specially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. He's saying he belongs there. He's saying he belongs with you. Now he'll be profitable. He's like, there was a reason that he left. He came to me. I got him saved. Now take him back, is what he's saying. Paul's saying, like, maybe there's some divine intervention here. You know, it, you know, it kind of begs the question. Now, here's the speculation. It begs the question on why Onesimus didn't get saved at Philemon's church. I mean, you can sit there and you can bounce um, that one around in your head all you want. The Bible just doesn't say. But, I mean, you can kind of think about this. I've seen this several times. I mean, here's my opinion on it. Several times I've seen this in my life where maybe it's a relative of yours or a very close friend of yours, and you've just given that person the gospel like so many times. Like, they just... They just don't even want to hear it from you. They, they don't receive it from you. They don't listen to you. But then when they hear it from somebody else, it makes a big difference. That's happened many times in this church with relatives of church members, friends of church members. They come to the church and it's like, you know, they've given them the gospel many, many times themselves, but they come here and they hear it from somebody else, from a personal worker at this church or my wife or whoever, and they just, it just clicks with them. And, you know, I don't know why that is. It's just the way the Lord works, right? But he clearly, so I don't know why he didn't get saved at Philemon's church. But he left Philemon, he left Colossae, in my opinion, and he went and he found Paul, and he got saved there, number one, and then he became profitable there, number two. So, the first thing is, is he left the church at Colossae. And he ran into Paul. Now, how many of you think that he accidentally ran into Paul in Rome in prison? You know, he probably didn't just accidentally stumble across Paul. I believe Onesimus sought out Paul. He left Philemon and sought out Paul, which, you know, that says something about him, in my opinion. Look at verse number 17 of Philemon. Look at verse 17 of Philemon where it says, if thou count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. So Paul is like just straight up vouching for this guy. He's like, pretty much, you treat him like you would treat me. That's how highly Paul thinks of this man. He says, if he hath wronged thee, or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. He's, he doesn't say you, he has wronged you, or he does owe you anything, but he says, if he does, just, you know, just charge it to me. But then look what he says in verse number 19. Paul says, I have, written, I have written it with my own hand, I will repay it. Albeit I do not say to thee how thou owest unto me even thine own self besides. So Paul here is saying, he's, he's saying like, you know, if you're upset at this guy or you're mad at this guy that he left, maybe he left before his servitude was, was finished. That's, that's quite possible, you know, from uh, verse number 19. But Paul is basically saying, like, listen, buddy, it's like this guy came to me, I got him saved. He's like, I got you saved. So you probably shouldn't charge me, <laughs> is what Paul is saying here. Okay, so, I need, okay, so back, to, back to Onesimus, who's the point of the sermon this evening. He left Philemon. He left Philemon. He was a servant to him, possibly still owing him something. Possibly. You know, possibly he left before the debt was repaid. Possibly maybe he just wasn't a very good worker. You know, we just don't know, or both. Okay, but then the key here is then he goes to Paul in Rome. He crosses a body of water, seeks out Paul who is imprisoned in a house in Rome, and then Paul gets him saved, and then he becomes a great benefit to the ministry of Paul himself. Paul then vouches for him and says, you know, you need to go back to Philemon, and he vouches for him and tells Philemon, Take him back. He's going to be profitable now. 
Okay, so the point of the sermon this evening is, you know, from salvation to profit. You know, I want to answer a question for you this evening, a question that I'm sure many of you, uh, you know, many of you have asked yourself, have wondered to yourself, is like, why do most people that get saved not come to church? Why do most people that get saved not become profitable in their lives? Turn to Romans chapter 4. I want to answer, I want to answer this question because other people, look, people that are very critical of soul winning, they will use this against you. They will tell you, they'll say, oh, if you got so many people saved, if you got 200 some people saved last year, you know, in your church, where are all these people? That's what they will say. Turn to Romans chapter 4. So that's really the question that I want to answer for you this evening. So you can, you can respond um, to people like that. Look at Romans chapter 4 in verse number 4. So in Romans chapter 4, in verse number 4 and verse number 5, we see two people here. We see two people. The first one is in verse number 4. And the Bible says, Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. In verse number 4, we see someone that's doing good works. This is somebody that people in the world would look at and they would say, that's a good person right there. He's doing, he's doing great things. He's helping people. Whatever his good works are, whatever people think are good works, the guy in verse number 4 is doing it. But he doesn't have faith. Now to him that worketh is reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. So that guy that's doing all the good works in his life, and he's doing all these good works, but doesn't have the faith, all he's going to come up with is debt. Because the problem is, is that all your, we know that salvation is not of works. I mean, that's a very basic thing, but your good works can't cover your sins. That's the problem. It's very simple to understand that. But to the world... The guy in verse number four may seem like a nice guy, and the guy in verse number five might seem like a jerk. Look at verse number five. But to him that worketh not. But look, this guy's not doing anything good. This guy's just, he's not doing anything. He's not going to church. He's not doing good things. He's not doing what people would think were works. Okay? But to him that worketh not, but, there's a difference with this guy, but believeth on. Him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So the jerk is going to heaven, and the guy that's trying to be a good person is going to hell, is what this is saying. So it has nothing to do with your works to get saved. We know this. But here's the, the sad fact of life right here, is most people that get saved are this verse number five person. They get saved. It's not of works. And they worketh, they worketh not. That, that's really why. We could just pray and, and be done right here. But salvation is not of works. Works after salvation is, is a personal choice. You know, it's, it's out of uh, obedience to the Lord that saved you. So first, let's look at some, you know, psychological um, studies, okay? Let me talk to you a little bit about why this person exists in verse number five. Let's talk about character and what character is in someone's life. Okay, look, uh, you know, the definition of character, if you had to define it, it would be like, the, like the, the sum of all your qualities is your character. Everything that you believe in, how you act, why you act that way, this is your character. Now, in 1890, let me read you just a couple of things. You could read book after book after book about the things that I'm just going to explain to you um, in the next couple of minutes here. But look, in 1890, the, there was a theory that was first brought to public attention by Harvard psychologist William James. And it's in the principles of psychology that he wrote where he says, in most of us, by age 30, our character has set like plaster and will never soften again. Think about what he just said there. He's saying by the time people get to age 30 years old, their character, meaning the, the sum of all their qualities, is set like plaster. Occupational psychologist Carol Rothwell confirmed this and says, it is true that as we age, we find it more difficult to develop and some people become more stuck in their ways. Some people even stop developing as young as teenagers, this psychologist says. I mean, that's kind of scary to think, that by the time you're done being a teenager, your character is set. 
Okay, so basically what they're talking about, and like it's, it's just been studied and studied and studied, and you can read about it over, I could just read you quote after quote after quote on how your character, your mold, let's call it your mold, is set by the time, you know, at least by the time you're 30. Okay, I mean, your, your attitude, your opinions, your behavior, your likes, your dislikes. Music is a huge one. Music is a huge one, especially people that got saved later in life. If you got saved later in life, like myself, look, music is like a thing, like it's one of the hardest things because it's just, it's stuck in your head. It's stuck in your head. And by the time you're 30, your, your musical likes are, they're set. They're set like a mold. Okay, so you have to break that mold. But most people, the point I'm trying to make, and I'm trying to depress you tonight, there is some good news, but the point I'm trying to make is most people just follow their mold. That's it. That's what they do with their life. They follow their mold. They stick with the status quo of whatever was taught to them up until the point where they were 20 or 25 or 30. That's what becomes, and look, it's, it's for no particular reason which is crazy when you think about it, is for no particular reason other than they were just raised that way. Other than that's just what people before them did, maybe their parents, their family, all these things. They just do things because that's the way that they were told to do things or that's the way that they saw to do things and that became their mold. And it's very hard. I mean, some psychologists you know, would say, look, it just you can't break that mold. Some psychologists would say. It becomes their mold. That's why... That's why you've heard so many stories and, and studies about how change is very stressful for people. This is just a fact. Change is stress. Whenever anything changes in your life or just like as human beings, it, you know, there's whole management books on this where companies, they want to change something and they're like managing through change. How do we manage through this change without everyone quitting our company or without, you know, people revolting against us in our country? Because change stresses people out. That's why the, the change in our country over the last couple of years, it just stressed people out. Many people, they probably didn't even know why they were stressed. But it's a change and it stresses them out. Because look, it's, it's going against their mold. That's what it is. It's going against their mold of what their character was, what they were used to. And look, this is why, this is why ladies, this is why what you do when you homeschool your kids, this is why many people, they, they like the idea of homeschooling. They, they can't stand the public school system. I, look, I believe, I'm an optimist, I could be wrong in this, but I believe a majority of people in this country do not like what's happening in the public school system. That's what I believe. But here's the problem. Their, their mold is just the kids go to public school. That's their mold. The idea, ladies, the idea of doing what you do and homeschooling your kids is terrifying to most people. They probably won't say that out loud, but they, they think about it when they meet someone that homeschools or they meet somebody um, like you, they think about that, it literally terrifies them. Because not only, look, it's, it's their, mold, their whole life, the public school system, daycare, this idea that you put your kids in some institution and they're raised by somebody else, look, their whole life is built around that. Think about this. Their, their employment you know, the ladies are, you know, you have the working moms. You know, their, their finances are built around it. The behaviors of the whole family are built around that mold. That's why it's so terrifying. Look, this is, this is the devil's genius right here, is that nobody would even think about trying to break that mold because there's so much structure built around it. It seems, it seems to somebody that has their kids in public school that's maybe, you know, seven, eight years old, nine years old kids, it seems impossible for them to homeschool. They, they look at it and they're just like, they don't even consider it because they're just like, it's impossible. But that doesn't mean that they like what's happening in the public school. It's just their mold is, is set and it stresses them out even thinking about, you know, messing with this. Okay. This is why as a soul winner, as a soul winner, you will notice a trend. You will notice a trend that, look, and there's always exceptions. I'm not throwing a blanket statement, but you'll notice a trend. The older someone is, typically the less receptive they're going to be because they're more set in their ways. You know, they're, they're less likely to accept the gospel. Look, we get older people saved all the time. But in general, this is true because their mold is set. 
And then along those same lines, it's even harder for people. Once, once people do get saved, it's harder for them to change their lifestyle. That's why. Because their mold is set in their life. This is why you see this. You know? So you say, you know, you say, well, what about us? Are we a bunch of freaks? <laughs> no, here, think about this, though. Think about how elite you are just for one second. Let's just do some real quick math. Think about, you know, Brother Stucky and I would always argue, how many, what percentage of the world is saved? Let's say 1% of the world is saved. It's somewhere between 1% and 2%, probably. Okay? If you're a soul winner, you see this. Okay? Let's say 1% of the world is saved. Then let's say, of that 1% of people that get saved, let's say 1% get saved and then get into church and become profitable, like Onesimus became profitable. So, you, this evening, you are 1% of 1%. You know what that is? You are 1 in 10,000. That's how elite you are. You are 1 in 10,000. So, you know, you, th you say, why though? Why, why us? And I've thought this so many times. When we first moved to California and we were at Verity Baptist Church, I'm like, I thought that all the time. Like, what do we all have in common to the point where we all ended up here? What, you ever thought that about us? What do we all have in common to where we all ended up not only saved, but here? Seeking out a church where we can go and just take the word of God out and just, just fulfill the Great Commission like we're supposed to. And I mean, what, what, I mean, literally walking down, you know, walking down the street with a Bible in your hand is terrifying to most people. Most people are terrified at that. I mean, you're like, you're walking in public with a Bible? Are you crazy? Most people, most saved people think that that's a terrifying thought because it's not, it's not their mold. It's not their mold. So what is it about us? Well, here's the thing. In general, we, in general, the common denominator that you will find amongst people like us and people in churches like ours is that we're truth seekers. We're truth seekers. That's why, that's why you'll find um, so many people with conspiracy theories and that like looking into conspiracy theories. And look, there's not, you don't, don't get stressed out because maybe you don't believe the same conspiracy theory that Brother George or, or Brother Ryan or Brother Trevor has a different theory on something. Don't get, like, these are just people that are just looking for the truth. These are the, just people that are curious. These are just people that just don't, they just don't accept the narrative. I mean, look, if, if Brother so-and-so starts not coming to church because he's digging a bunker in his backyard or something, that's a little extreme. But the point is, is that that's why you will find people like that in churches like ours. Because they're just people that just don't accept things. They don't accept the status quo. They're questioning. They see something in the news. I mean, pretty much the news, you can just use the news to tell you what's not going on. This is how it didn't happen in the news. But the point is, is that that's why you'll find these types of people. Look, this was Onesimus. This was Onesimus. He left Philemon, he sought out Paul, and he got saved there. He got saved there. And look, I know he was that type of person because not only did he get saved from Paul, but he then became profitable to Paul and then also to Philemon. He wanted answers. He went to Paul for those answers. He didn't accidentally find Paul in Rome, folks. He didn't actually stumble into Rome and into Paul. He sought him out. This is the common denominator, is truth-seeking. You will find in this church, you'll find people from all different walks of life in this church. You know, and the one thing that we all have in common is that we, at some point, at some point we wanted to know what was true in our lives. I, I, can, almost, I can almost see, don't take this the wrong way, but I can almost see I mean, it's such a rare thing to have somebody get saved and then get profitable. I can almost see the Calvinist viewpoint where they're just like, you know, we must have been handpicked. I mean, can you kind of almost see it? I mean, I know the, the doctrine's wrong and all that, but it's just them coming to a wrong conclusion uh, of something. That's not it. It's that we are all seeking the truth. That's what it is. That's the common denominator. Regardless, look, regardless of the mold that we came from. Especially those who got saved later in life. Aside from ourselves, aside from our ways, aside from our culture, we just wanted to know what was true. I mean, you know that's true. Especially if you got saved later in your life, there was a point where you're just like, you know what, forget everything that I came from. 
I'm confused about this, and I want to know what the truth is. I mean, that happened to me. That happened to anybody else that got saved, especially as an adult. Look, it was hard for me to admit that I had been wrong for so many years. That was, that was not an easy thing to do, to admit that. But we always need to keep this attitude, though, in our lives, that we need to be truth seekers, this desire. Because, look, it will serve you. It will serve you throughout your whole life being a truth seeker. My goal is that, you know, as you sit in a church like this for years and years and years, you will learn more and more and more truth here. You will know the Bible because, look, you'll learn it here. You'll learn the Bible here. We were just talking to some ladies out soul winning. Brother Matt and I were just talking to these um, ladies at their door, and this lady was super upset at, like, all these churches that she had gone to. She's like, they just lie to us there. They just go and they just lie to us, and they tell us all this stuff, so they can get all our money. And, and just, she's like super upset at like all the churches that she went to. And I'm like, well, you know, I can't guarantee that you're going to like everything you hear here. But, you know, I won't lie to you. You know, we'll tell you what the Bible says, regardless. You know, the truth. Right? I mean, there's a guy. Look, I mean, that, that's my goal is that we can all learn the Bible together over the years and years and years. Just continue, continue, continue learning truth and seeking truth our whole lives. We're saved just learn more and more and more truth. It'll, it'll never end in your life. There was, a guy, there was a guy giving the guys a quiz out soul winning on Saturday. I mean, this guy, he's like giving, he's got these gotcha questions from the Bible. The guy knows he's not saved. He knows nothing about the Bible. But he's got like five gotcha questions that he likes to ask people. And like our guy's got like four out of the five, <laughs> which, is, which shows you how much, you know, just knowledge uh, of the Bible that you will learn if you're just seeking truth in your life. I mean, he threw out like a, a gotcha question about like what city, what city did, did Joshua, you know, is, is spoken of in the Bible before Joshua got to Jericho. And it's like this one verse in the Bible that talks about the city of Adam. You know, and just, he knows nothing about the Bible, but he just finds some gotcha questions so he can lift himself up and puff himself up to people. But he doesn't even understand the simplest thing in the Bible, which is the gospel. And he had no interest in the gospel. So look, we're truth seekers. That's what I'm trying to get you to understand. Onesimus was a truth seeker. We are truth seekers. That's what we have in common. And look, it's, it, truth is much more than the gospel. It's all these philosophies of life that the Bible has, science that the Bible has, all of it. I mean, you know, why else would you come here? You know, it's much easier to go to a church, probably, that lies to you. I mean, there was a, a church a lady was talking about on Saturday, Sunday, She's talking about we're just a very affirming church. That's what she said to Brother Trevor. She's like, we're, we're very affirming. And then the first thing she lists is like all these different perversions that they affirm in their church. Look, that's not truth. That's not truth. And we are after the truth, which is why we're here, which is why Onesimus went and found Paul. But most people, the problem, and back to the answer to your question, the reason that people will get saved, but they will not change their lives and get profitable is because they're not seeking the truth in their life. That, that's, it's that simple. Turn to John chapter 18. They probably, you know, many people, well, if they get saved, they believe in some truth. They believe in the Bible, but they just, it takes that extra, you know, desire to seek the truth to actually break your mold in your life. But some people don't believe in any truth. Look at John chapter 18. Look at John chapter 18. Look at Pontius Pilate. Pontius Pilate. Look at John chapter 18 and verse number 37. John chapter 18. Look at verse number 37. The Bible says, Pilate therefore, he's, he's talking to Jesus. Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? And Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness, here we go again, Jesus is the faithful and true witness, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Everyone that is of the truth heareth my voice. So, first of all, if you have a desire and you're seeking a, the, what the Bible says, you're seeking the Word of God, look, you're of the truth. You're who Jesus is talking about here. He's like, if you're sitting here and you're listening to a Bible study on a Wednesday night, you're of the truth. You want to know what the Word of God says. Jesus is saying, you're, you're who I'm talking about. Who is of the truth, heareth my voice. Pilate saith unto him, what is truth? 
Pilate didn't even have any idea. He, you know what he's saying here? He's saying, there is no truth. He's saying, one man's truth, have you ever met this person? One man's truth is as good as another man's truth. Your truth, my truth, his truth, what's the difference? What Pilate is saying is that he doesn't believe in any absolute truth. And Jesus is the absolute truth, so he certainly doesn't believe in him. One man's truth is as good as another. So Pontius Pilate didn't believe in any truth, but he was wrong. There is a truth, and actually the truth was standing, the irony of that situation was the truth was standing right in front of him when he said that. It was Jesus. It's the Word of God. And we should always be seeking it. But here's the thing. Most people just aren't. That's just the way people's molds are. And unless people, you know, are seeking the truth despite their mold, look, there was a lot of, I, I still remember, there was a lot of things. Look, I got saved and then start learning the Bible and start listening to the Bible and start just like figuring out how to live this Christian life. And look, there's a lot of things where I'm just like, oh man, that's quite different than my mold. That's way different than, you know, the, the character that I was brought up in or the way that I was, you know, the way that my mold was set. And look, you just have to break that mold. So the question is, you sit here and you say, oh, it's hopeless. You know, it's depressing. But it's not, because turn to Matthew chapter 19. Because man may say it's impossible. Man may say it's impossible. But, you know, man's studies will say again and again, you just can't change who you are after you're 30. Some people say after you're a teenager. But that's not what the Bible says. And that's the good news tonight. So, you know, yes, generally, generally people's molds are set. I agree with the generalization of that. But look at Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter 19, look at verse 23. Then Jesus said unto his disciples, Verily I say unto you that a rich man shall hardly enter into the kingdom of heaven. And again I say unto you, It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. When his disciples heard it, they were exceedingly amazed, saying, Who then can be saved? But Jesus beheld them and said unto them, With men this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. In this particular case, you had a person who just like was in love with their possessions and just couldn't, you know, walk away from their possessions. And he's saying, look, a rich man, and he, and he compares a camel going through the eye of a needle. And the, the disciples are like, it's impossible. Nobody can get saved. They're like, because everybody cares about things in this world. It's impossible. We're all doomed. Like, even we care about things in this world. We're all doomed. But look, he says, with men, this is impossible. It's the same thing. It's the same thing the psychologist told you from the books that I just, from, that I just read you. Yeah, with men, breaking the mold is impossible. With, with studies from psychology, they'll say you can't break that mold. But look, with God, everything is possible. And we, look, we, we are proof of that. We are proof of that. Look around. You know, look at everybody you know from other churches. Look at all your friends. We are proof that it's possible with God. That we can, you know, not only get saved, but become profitable. Look, it may not be the most common thing in the world. You know, it may be uncommon, but it's, it's definitely possible. Now, here's what's better, though. Here's what's better. Here's what's better. As we, you know, break our molds, like I had to break a whole bunch of molds. I had to go and just start be breaking molds all over the place in my life. And maybe you had to break molds. Maybe I had to break more molds than you did or whatever. But the point is, we were just kind of like, we made that decision. Like, hey, if it's in the Bible, we're going to break our mold. This is going to become my mold. But the beauty is, is that with our kids, as they're raised seeking truth, as they're raised learning the truth, guess what? This becomes their mold. And the idea is that our kids, they won't have to break as many molds as, as we had, to, as I had. To, you know, I, I don't want my kids to have to break as many molds as I had to break. You know, the Word of God, as they, you know, they grow up and they know they get saved, and they become profitable after that, that is their mold. That's, that's the model here, is that they don't have to break a mold to come into the mold of the Bible. They just, they just adopt that mold. It's just they, they're raised in it. That's the idea of the Bible. But look, for people that have to break their molds, they, they, they can still get saved. 
their hearts are still, unless their heart is completely twisted and, and scarred, they can still get saved. But the reason that you're not seeing, that you won't see just every single one of them get into church is because people are just molded. That's it. Molded. And they just go with the status quo in their lives. And it's hard for people to do that. It's hard for people to throw those molds away. Thank God that it's possible through the Word of God. And we need to, you know, we need to be convincing to people out there. Hey, you don't have to live this way. You know, you can break the mold of where you came from. You are not defined by who your parents were. You are not defined by how you were raised. You can change your character. And the Bible, the Word of God, can do that for you. But our kids, thank God that they don't have to break that mold. Thank God that they will just have the correct mold from the beginning. So Onesimus, when I look at Onesimus, I feel the guy got beat up. The guy gets beat up all the time in the Bible. But I look at a guy, I look at a guy, Onesimus, who maybe he did wrong by Philemon. Maybe he did wrong by Philemon. But he went out and he sought out Paul. For whatever reason, maybe he didn't believe Philemon. Maybe there were some personality problems there. Maybe there was things that, you know, Onesimus was doing wrong. Maybe. But the point is, he went and he sought out Paul. He sought the truth. He found it. And then he was super special because he became profitable when he knew the truth. Just like you. But it's not common. And that's why um, you'll see the same thing today. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.